is that darn Cardi Jew? They're making us ravenous look horrible. If you've enjoyed this program, please click like and subscribe. Shalom, and welcome again to another exciting edition of the Torah Watchman Show International 501c3 Company, hosted by none other, your very favorite and humblest of all Cardi Jews, Rev Yar bin Emet. I hope everyone's been well. I've missed you so much. At the close of every uh, Parsha video I do, I know you miss me, but you should have a tick in your heart and know that I will come back very soon. Okay? The gift that keeps on giving is the Torah Watchman Show International. I hope everyone's had a wonderful week. Did you know that the Jews created the practice of spring cleaning? Yes, we have. We clean our homes head to stern. At least my righteous Esha Kyle does that. Yes, I do heavy lifting too. I carry a lot of heavy things back and forth, namely pots and pans that are substandard for mundane days of the year, but we bring out high quality things just for Passat. So we do inventory control management in our home. Okay, everyone does it a little bit different, like Carter Jews. Passat can literally in the Torah is a one day event. It's, a, it's Nassan 15. It's not an entire week. Why do you need an entire week to remember Zolka Pasak? I have no problem with any high holiday celebrating. Okay, even though I have to work, I have work commitments, I'm a supervisor with the government, I have to do my due diligence there, I have to pay the mortgage. Someone has to pay the bills, right? I can't sit in yeshiva all day long when my righteous wife works two jobs to make enemies. That happens in some places uh, among our, our Jewish brothers and sisters throughout the world. But it's matzah time, right? Unleavened bread. Couple notes here about the sock before I get started in our parsha. Parsha Mazora. Um, about the sock rules, the difference between rabbinic, Orthodox Judaism, and Carded Judaism. Okay? First of all, I just told you in the Torah. Cardi's follow verbatim. It's humanly possible to understand something. And it's black and white truth. It's not out of our reach. We can understand what, what God said to Moshe. Remember, most of Israel during that time, 3,500 years ago, were illiterate. Only the Levites were schooled in Hebrew. Only schooled in the Torah. And I said the chief priests probably, they were taught by the Levites. And of course, the oral tradition, yes, oral tradition, do not come from Mount Sinai. Every single race of people has oral tradition. We pass things down in stories and lore and uh, fairy tales or whatever from generation to generation. Door to door. Yeah, we, I love those words, but it, we do. But in Carded Judaism, we have delicious pakalam. That is the focal point. Pakalam, because the Torah says you will have pakalam. In fact, it was so critically important that with the rush getting out of Egypt and Pharaoh's uh, impetus in saying, you get out of this country, I don't want to see you, a curse upon the nation, my nation is ruined because of your God. They left so quickly that some of the lower class Jews that did not have all the resources together, they could not partake on Pakalem. But when they got into the wilderness, after Mount Sinai, God said, okay, the people appealed to Moshe, Moshe went to the master adjudicator of truth, and God said, yes, give them a second Passover. But you are not allowed to have Pesach ever again until you're in the land of Israel. Remember the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness? There were no uh, Pesach. And uh, Nisan, um the 15th came, came and went. Of course, in the Torah, there's no named months of the year. 12 months, or more or less 13 months in leap years. That's why we have Adar the second. Well, we are, you know, the, for... The sake of simplicity, we are in the month of Nisan, and we are getting ready for the eve of Pesach. It's when you do a lot of last minute running around the house looking for the dreaded hamats and everything else. Listen, Carter Jews love the, the same game as Robinus, because Robinus layered upon layer upon layer, they have a, they have a, 
uh, Talmud tractate of called Basak, and Rashi uh, goes crazy with all these isms and everything else. And I don't allow any alcohol in my home. Why? How is alcohol produced? It's, it's produced by mold. Yeast is a mold type of fungi. Fungi, okay? Fungus ammonis, you hear about that. Well, Robin, I say, well, this is a different kind of yeast because we, we grew it not on bread, but on an apple or something else, okay? It's still an, a contaminant that's why in temple sacrifices, when the Jews brought grain offerings before the Lord, on, uh, even on Passover, they brought grain offerings. They were allowed to have grains in a private residence. They were not allowed to have any leavening agent. Leavening agent has been around forever. Uh, and when people, you know, you have bread staying out too long, you see that green, green mold there. But people realize when you scrape it off and make powder and all that, you, if you add it into fresh uh, bread dough, that it causes it to rise after a couple of hours. That's how we make challah. The main main thing is no no um, alcohol in your home because alcohol is produced. Well, how? Yes, by yeast and mold that cause fermentation fermentation of grape juice, of raspberry juice, and other things like that. So we we're gonna. I cannot find any raisin wine like Cardi's juice in Egypt. Uh, I'm gonna have just grape juice. Okay, and it will be drunk up before it can ferment. It'll be refrigerated too. But anyway, so the big thing is not grain products. So Hamath, Robin has defined um, uh, Hamath as multiple different types of grain. In fact, soybeans not even allowed in uh, Orthodox homes. Why? Uh, do you know how to make bread out of soybean? I don't. And there's certain nuts that are not allowed either. Well, Cardi Jews on Passover are nuts about nuts. And they have something like... Uh, like the same equivalent of charasat, you know, that mortar kind of nuts and you mold and it's kind of gray substance. Really good, tasty, you spread it on your matzah and everything else. Well, they're, they're a little bit different with that too. Main thing with Cardi Jews, they have paka lamb. What do Robinus have instead? They have a shank bone and egg. Why do they have that? It's kind of depressing. Well, they stay depressed because they never hope on a on Mashiach coming or the temple, because in 1967, the chief rabbinate said, we don't want a temple because we want to keep our rabbinate authority going and our franchise uh, going uh, enterprise-wide throughout the world. We're making lots of money. We don't need that temple because that would shut down the enterprise. I'm being facetious, but I, I'm, I'm also <clears throat> being fair and honest and truthful. This is what Reb Yaharabim it is. Emet means truth, right? Our God is true, right? So back to Pesach. I'm going to have Paco lamb every day, especially on the first day, okay? Yes, I'm going to celebrate it the entire week. And yes, I'm going to raise it up a little bit in a couple of notches uh, on the last day of Pesach, and that's a hog too. Uh, definition, any Christians out there, Messianic, no hides out there. Now listen, a hog means a high day. By the way, talking about high days, listen, the month of Pesach, according to Shemot, I think chapter 12, is the head of all months of the year. Robin has forgot that, so they added three more years. They didn't have a New Year celebration for animals in the month of Elo. Everyone knows Rosh Hashanah is in festival. That was created, invented in Babylonia. Uh, I don't know why. And Tisrei is actually a Babylonian word, probably points to a, a Babylonian idol. They were surrounded by idols, so they used symbology and the language and everything else. A lot of uh, rabbis and Jews there in Babylonia spoke Babylonian. They mixed it with their tongue, with their vernacular tongue. Anyway, I just had to get this out because this Parsha falls, falls in a month in the sun. And it, this is actually leading up in about a week or so. We're going to have Passover. I hope everyone is scheduled. You implore to get off at least the first day of Passover. Listen, help your wife if you're married. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're single, whatever, get someone to help you to clean at home. We invented spring cleaning, not the Greeks. Okay. Again, thank you for your attention to this this uh, Torah Watchman video. My appeal and my love as, as for my Cardi brothers and sisters around the world, we are growing. By the tens of thousands, we are growing. And, and, and we are doing things in a way that are getting Jews' attention around the world. We're actually allowing converts for the first time in probably the last 10 years or so we allowing converts to come. We focus on 
on the father's bloodline and not just the mother's bloodline. Okay, that's the difference there. But anyway, to each their own. I love all of you. I love all my Jewish brothers, any Reform Jews out there. There's a lot of good Reform rabbis out there. They're decent. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, point my finger. I'm not going to commit Lashana Ra. You know, the rabbinists love to have the least common denominator from Parsha of Mazora. Lashana Ra means evil talk. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's get started. This is actually a short Parsha. This is usually conjoined with, with um, Tazria. All on non leap years, but now it's a separate parsha. Okay? Leviticus Baakra, chapter 14, verse 1 to chapter 15, verse 33. Okay? Mazora is often translated to leper, at least in the Middle Ages when they translate, but it's not the same thing as leper, leprosy. Okay? Um, I'm going to show you some pictures here in a few minutes of, of leper colonies, historical leper colonies. It's actually leper colonies that are active in certain parts of the world. Leprosy essentially was wiped out. Most of it is extinct most places in the world. It's from unclean condition, from bad water, um, um, human waste and things of this nature. It's bacterial infection, okay? And so is syphilis, syphilis and BD and sexual diseases and we're getting that in. By the way, a brief disclaimer, this Parsha gets down in the weeds a little bit and kind of muddy a little scandalous, so I'd say it's rated PG-13. So if you have small children out there, uh, just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just hide their ears a little bit when I say certain words, okay? Okay. All right. I, I'm kind of shy, too, myself. All right. So in Leviticus 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 2, you'll find the word, first word, Mazora. Okay? So we're talking about the Lord says to Moshe, that's how it each chapter is, is introduced, by the way. However, it's interesting in this Parsha, the name of God is not mentioned predominantly throughout the entire Sidra. Why? Well, I was talking about the Torah, the Torah, the Torah, the Torah. The Torah is the embodiment of God's truth. That's the way I look at it, okay? So in a general overview, we're talking about Mazara. We're talking about the need for purification, uh, Tazara, all the skin maladies you can think about. We talked about this uh, last Parsha. Contracted a result. Now, Robinet say you get Tazarot and you get these skin lesion, uh, disfiguring things on your face and blisters and all that because you spread evil talk. This is what Rashi said that did not make it the Torah true. Lashana Ra does not occur anywhere in the five books of the Torah and is not talked about by any of the Lord's prophets either. It's something invented by the rabbinate. I made a whole video about this. I'm going to get into it. To protect the inner circle of them against any kind of accusation. Quickly, Lashana Ra is defined by rabbinate as evil talk. They've even gone as far if someone has actually been sincerely wrong, had money stolen from them, or um, someone did something illegal or unethical or immoral to this person, and even if you had two witnesses willing to testify on your behalf, Robin has said, even if it's true, don't talk about it. It's Lashana Ra. Especially if you know about a rabbi doing something illegal, and we have rabbis going to jail. They're, they're, they're not more perfect than me. They're just human beings, right? And they're certainly not prophets of God. And the sages weren't prophets of God. And they no telling what they did in, in back corners in the dark. I'm not going there. I'm not going to impugn anyone's reputation and commit the horrible sin of Lashon Ra. Listen, evil gossip is wrong. Gossiping in period, you know, is, is not about fact. It's about whispering an untruth, an exaggerated truth to someone else, and then causing that to grow and spawn like a, like a contagion disease, a contagious disease. Well, listen, if you have an accusation against someone quickly, and you have witnesses to back what you're saying, go to your rabbi. Go to your rabbi and tell them the truth and have your witnesses back up your truth. This is how anything is said on in court. Like, unfortunately, if you need to get a divorce. And rabbinists didn't allow uh, Carter Jews to get divorces in the 12th and 13th century. Why? Because they said you're not Jews because you were not born of a Jewish mother. And that's something else a, a first century rabbi invented. Let us get all this out of the way, okay? I do love all of you. I don't mean to rant. Okay? We're also talking about a Tazarat house. Yeah. You got a Tazarat person that makes a house Tazarat. In other words, it makes it infected, okay? And the urgent need when you're in the land 
a visual, but especially in 3,500 years ago, on that parchment of land, and it was different all the time on how the, the um, Mishkan and the tabernacle was broken down and moved, the Ark of the Covenant, all those holy things were moved back and forth, and God's Sh Shekinah glory moved and directed the path and everything else, the angel of the Lord was there. Every time that settled, every time that cloud of glory was above the Mishkan, which actually descended to the middle of the Ark of the Covenant between the two carving wings. You can picture that, the holy. Only a priest, a Kohen Gadol, was allowed to go there once a year, and that's Yom Kippur. But that, that presence, that quantum entanglement between space and time, between God's throne, his seraphim, everything there, changed the atomic structure of the sand crystals, literally, where the people were, were, were standing. Every individual had the civil right to go before the Lord their God or go before their favorite priest and come to the tabernacle and present a grain offering, a meal offering, two turtle doves, a lamb offering, and, and etc., etc. So if they had uncleanness upon them, you could die if you do not admit what's called an uncleanness. Where am I getting at quickly? This is very important to understand. And my rabbi and my conservative show said the same thing, okay? Jews, at least back then, we can hide a lot today, especially rabbis can hide a lot. They don't talk about each other rabbis, uh, even if they're in jail, uh, even if they beat their wives and they run around their way. You don't talk about it, you know, you just don't, don't talk about it because it's forbidden territory, it's a taboo, you know? But what, what I'm saying is the various uh, issues that can cause Tazarat, is that a Jew wears what's happening in his soul, his nefesh, Yehudi, on the outside. So if you have a sick soul within you, and it's full of sin that you have not confessed, you know you've done something wrong, that guilty conscience is keeping you awake at night, but for whatever reason you don't confess it. You don't make retribution to your fellow neighbor. Maybe uh, someone uh, loaned you out money, and six months later you're trying to run away and tore up the contract and the evidence, that someone ever loaned you money, whatever it may be, or you're cheating on your wife, whatever happens. But God knows the truth. And if you refuse to confess that truth, you have that outside witness for everyone else, namely a leprosy-like condition, even the fact that in your hair, the hair would fall out, whatever, is a horrific condition. Even a king of Israel had this problem too. And uh, other other people in the, in the Torah also discussed who in the prophets and kings has discussed very instances where, where general, I think last parsha we talked about, a general to the king of Aram got leprosy too. Okay. What I'm saying is be careful what you think, be careful what you do, be careful when you, when you keep things in secret. God knows the, the secrets of the heart. Now, we may not break out in Tazerot today like the Jews did then, simply because we're not standing before God's throne. And most of us are in the diaspora, and there's no temple, there's no red heifer, there's no chief priest that's a fit, a, 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 a officiating before the temple. So we're in that situation, okay? So in the first portion, first uh, Aliyah, Leviticus chapter 14, verse uh, 1 through 12, a couple of verses I throw out here, Sid Ross. Um, this shall be a law of a person afflicted with Tazra. On the day of his cleansing, he shall be brought to the Kohen. So if this someone, they realize they have Tazra. It's an open thing. They may, you know, a lot of lepers, you see them, they have uh, clothes like ash, ash cloth or whatever, sackcloth with it, covering the head and toe, and they call out leper, leper or whatever. I always told you for the leper colonies and things like that. Um, unfortunately, um, Jews had this condition too and they were kept outside of Israel for whatever reason, whatever action, actions have consequences, there is causality with this. But you know, when someone, the best practice is, if you know you've got um, a wound on you that's not going away and especially oozing blood or water or liquid or whatever, then you, then you notify your chieftain or significant other, you notify your chieftain, the chieftain notifies a local priest responsible for communicating God's word and talking to Moshe 
and the 70 judges, etc., etc. Then the Kohen Gadol will make an appointment for you to, to him to come by. He's like a medical doctor who examined the lesion on you. Then he'll make a determination. He'll come back seven days and see if it's healed or gotten worse. Now, the assumption, unfortunately, during that time is that you've done something wrong. You've sinned like Job was covered with blisters and sores and everything else um, because of his uh, the struggle between Hasatan and God and the debate they had over Job's worthiness, not getting in, into that story. What I'm saying is that people assume that that person is a sinner, cheated on his wife, especially if his wife had the same condition in the house, he had fun, fungi growing on the insides of it, and mold and mildew, okay? What it is, you know. I got myself in a lot of trouble, but the way to get out of it is confess your sins for the Lord your God, make restitution, and do exactly what a Kohen Gadol advises you, whatever ritual is appropriate, whatever melody, um, uh, treatment program he advises, like hyssop and water and things of this nature, cleansing, mikvahs and things like that, whatever is required, you do it and make retribution, and then hopefully within a couple of weeks you'll be totally healed and you'll be part of tribal Israel again because you were an outsider and you were called home back to tribal Israel over this condition, okay? Um, the the Kohen shall go outside the camp because this is where the people were moved. Can you imagine me being away from your wife, your children for an isolated time? This is how you deal with epidemic situation. The Jews knew about this 3,500 years ago. We found out about it in early 1900s in the Spanish flu. Okay, whatever. 1800s, a medical doctor discovered the, um, the benefit of washing your hands when you deliver babies. Anyway, all kidding aside. The first Aliyah, the purification procedure is detailed here in Leviticus. How Tazrat is being healed. The motivation is to heal the Tazrat as soon as possible. Seven days of, of, of cleanliness, review, and assessment was necessary for this before the coin could all. This was actually mandated by God. Okay? So at least seven days, this individual has Tazrat like lesions and conditions on their body has to be outside of Israel. And the individual shaves the entire body, and for a seven day wait, the person shaves again and brings three animals and an, and an oil offering to the temple, okay? So in other words, you may have a lesion growing underneath your hair, so if you shave all your hair, baby yourself, shave, uh, shave your beard off, almost like you're sitting Shiva in morning, and in your, actually morning, and you come out and then people see you pretty much in your undergarment, it's very embarrassing, but that's the whole point of humility, right? If you want forgiveness from the Lord your God, you need to do something to prove that you have come from a humble, contrite heart. And the second Aliyah, Leviticus chapter 14, verses 13 to 20. Verse 13, he says, He shall slaughter the lamb in, in, a, in, in the place where one slaughters the sin offering and the burnt offering in a holy place. Designated by the Kohen Godal. But regarding the Kohen's Services, it's guilt offering, it's like a sin offering. It is it is a holy of holies type of offering. It means it goes before God, not just the priest. In the second Aliyah, we discussed the various processes, methods, and techniques employed by the Kohen Gadol, the priesthood, Levitical priesthood. And uh, third Aliyah, we talk about Leviticus chapter 14, verses 21 to 23. That is the, the um, Aliyah Torah section there. Verse 21, but if he's poor and cannot afford, listen, we had we had a a treatment program for all economic strata. Okay? Whether you're rich or poor, it does not matter. The need is the need is still there to get better. He shall take one male lamb as a guilt offering instead of two or whatever for a waving to affect atonement of sin. You take part of the lamb and you wave it before God. Um, and a one tenth of, of ephra of flour mixed with oil as a meal offering and as a log of oil. Like I said before, ephra, measurement of meal offering, all the Jews, all the too many of them had had to have that flour, that very very fine ground flour, unleavened, you know, uh, no, not a uh, self-rising flour, of course, but they had it in their homes during the week of Passover. They had to, because they had to make these offerings. You know, you could you could get Tazarite condition 
any time of the year, right? That's what I'm saying. So the third aliyah we're talking about, the Tazara condition, if you can afford, they had budgets and all this. Uh, God looked at every situation individually. The judges ruled differently based on people. Sometimes you can bring two, two birds, you don't have a, a lamb. Uh, lamb can be quite expensive if you don't make most of your barter and trade from shep shepherding. Um, this section also describes a slightly different purification process reserved for an impoverished person. Okay, everything is uh, equal before the Lord of God, no, despite the resources you have to bring before God. Okay, you certainly don't need the blood of a Messiah to have your sin forgiven. You don't. And then hopefully that ties with the condition go away. As soon as as uh, the coin of Gadol priest says you're kosher. Okay. Now for all y'all, uh, we're talking about Leviticus chapter 14 verses 33 to 53. We're going to read 36 here. The Kohen shall, or, shall order that they clear out the house before the Kohen comes in to look at the lesion. Everyone out, only the Kohen Gadol, because he would be temporarily unclean too just by touching and interacting with people okay and there was a treatment for that situation too so that everything in the house could um could be assessed for cleanliness like a sign of mold or something growth on the walls or on the clothes or blankets bedding whatever after this the coin shall come back and look at the house okay so the owner of the house whoever is officiating officiating on behalf of the person tazara will clean out the house move the family members, everything else, probably take all the bedding, everything else out of the house and present it for inspection. You had to do that. For Falial, homes could be Tazarat in that this is a fungal infection. Leprosy is a bacterial infection. The reason I say it's fungal infection, because it says you, your house can catch Tazarat too. That means it's fungi. You got a fungus ammonis, okay? And it's interesting. Uh, this is not the fungus you would use to grow bread or to make uh, grain-based alcohol either. And if you had these things going on during Passover, that would be pretty bad. I don't know how that would be dealt. Um, but that's a day of absolutely no work. And it does not talk about, in the time of Pesach or whatever, in a high holiday, does not talk about um, stopping work or stopping this or cessation of this. Listen, if you have someone with a life and death disease, the Kohen Gadol drops everything they're doing or someone who's a, who's representing the Kohen Gadol, maybe one of his sons or grandson, to take care of the individual. The quality of Jewish life is the most important thing here, not legalism, okay? So in the fourth valley off, indeed, the discoloration it seems to be Tazra. I'll show you a picture here of house that's infected with some sort of fungal mildew infection. Like I said, in the last Parsha, um, hazmat teams can be called with a mask and shields and everything else that could totally just condemn the house and burn it to the ground. Sometimes you had to do it back then too. And it would be a huge loss, a huge loss to the owner. This process, uh, priest quarantines the home up to three weeks, okay, after it's treated. So I guess it's washed uh, with some sort of detergent, a soap, a cleanser. I'm not sure what was used, uh, but the, the priest would bless the home. And sometime, I read about this, when the Jews went into Canaan, they, they occupied or possessed homes that were not theirs natively. Uh, when they defeated the Canaanites and removed them from the villages, they inherited their homes and property. Sometimes they were infected with this Tazarat condition too. So God had a method for that as well. So depending on the spread of discoloration, the home is either declared to be pure or the specific stones are removed from the house and in the most extreme situation, the house can be demolished. So you could actually have a life cycle process here where, you know, a fungal infection of Taz right in the house, you can see that it's already beginning to die and go away. You know, bleach is a good way today. I don't think they had it back then to remove mildew and things like that, okay? Some people pressure wash their decks and their fences because it's mildew and fungal growth, okay? Um, the Torah then describes the purification process of such home, which is very similar to the initial stage of the purification of human. The human was quantumly tangled with their home because suppose it is a place where they live, the place that did righteous things and not so righteous things, and supposedly read the Torah 
and prayed and things of this nature, okay? Every single home is an aspect of a synagogue. Um, I look at that very much in my dining room, okay? Um, in the fifth aliyah, the conclusion of the subject Tazra, and then we're going to get into something a little bit different. Uh, the Torah discusses the ritual impurity of a man who issues a sickly and unnatural seminal discharge. Yes, we're talking about sexual intercourse, we're talking about nocturnal uh, emissions, all these things, we're getting into that area. Believe it or not, Sigmund Freud was not around, but the God of Moses was talking to people about their sex lives. We're humans, right? People have to form, form a mates and everything else to form families, you do family planning. Well, things don't work out uh, the way you intended to, unfortunately, sometimes. And that's the justification of this Torah Parsha. So in the sixth, sixth um, Aliyah portion, Leviticus chapter 15, verses 16 to 28, verse 19, if a woman has a discharge, her flesh discharging blood, uterus and everything else rebuilding itself once uh, about a week out of 30 days is a woman typical woman's menstrual cycle so they can become fertile again and then um go into family planning stages where uh, a husband and wife could try to have a child okay this is nature's way okay uh, the uterus fills with blood the lining gets too thick and then you have hormone hormones changing and things of that nature and cause a menstrual cycle Women that get older uh, can have menopause and things of that nature when the hormones go haywire and, and then all that bleeding stops and cessates, okay? Most younger women uh, with young children that are still menstruating, and menstruating just simply means bleeding. Men can menstruate too if they're bleeding uh, from their various orifices, that's all I'm gonna say there. And then they, they are washed in the mikvah, actually not bleeding anymore, and they're pronounced kosher, generally by a, a wife of a rabbi does this, and my wife goes to this ceremony and ritual, and I highly endorse it. It's a wonderful feeling of being clean and kosher before God. And it also is in the Torah. It's amazing. Okay, so in the sixth aliyah, this section discusses the ritual impurity contract, contracted by a man who issues a normal seminal addition. In other words, seed prop, um, appropri um, uh, appropriation to make a child, fertilization of an egg, and et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing. Sexual intercourse, okay? Family planning, okay? But what happens sometimes, um, there's leakage here, um, um, there is contamination of the bed covers. Listen, if you don't clean your sheets and sanitize them with bleach and everything, and you have sexual intercourse, you know, it could be infectious and things of this nature. Uh, Sometimes people hate sleeping in hotels for that reason. You know who, who was in that bed and what they were doing before you got there. And the sheet's supposed to be clean. And then you see a stain off to the side. Listen, I hate to be like this, but I'm trying to give you imagery here to understand the same issues that plague humanity today was going on back then and God had a solution. You know, God has that closed door talk with us. He can, you can talk to God about anything. You can talk to God about your sex life. You could talk to God about family planning. You could talk about God about the satisfying relationship of, of husband and wife and everything else if you have problems in your marriage. Not everyone, not every man based on his cardiac condition and health and blood pressure can, can even have sexual relations. It's a blessing and a gift and even in orthodoxy, they say it's a blessing and gift. Rabinitz says it's okay to have sexual relations on Shabbat Carded you, say no, because the Torah says you have to take a bath and you have to change your sheets because, and you're not allowed to do any of that kind of work on Sabbath. It's interesting in a different viewpoint, but we still deal with the same fundamental systemic issues of uncleanliness. There's no red heifer and there's no temple. So what do you do? Okay. And what can happen if someone is cheating on their wife or, the, or a woman is cheating on their husband they go from home to home and home and have sexual relationship, then um, people may not see what's happening at night, but you know, there are swingers and all this, then you have Tazra growing on, on, on the inside of your house. You got, you got the rabbi coming by, you got the priest coming by, oh, what's that nasty growth growing on the wall? What's going on in his home? You have something confessed to me. 
Now tell me, let's sit down, let's talk about what's going on. The thoughts of the heart, whether negative or positive, can lead to a blessing or demolishment. So the co the cohabitation. Okay. The seventh folly I want to reiterate for a close at Parsha is a very beautiful story. Okay? On the subject of menstruating women, a temporary period of uncleanliness for about a week. And then almost about a, um, a week after that, there was a monitoring by the Kohen, the husband, whatever, reporting, whatever. And, and then they are not bleeding anymore. But still, the period of uncleanliness needs to be adjudicated before the temple and the Kohen priest as some sort of offering. Now, a woman can actually bring two turtle doves with her. You can imagine a woman, a young woman, a mother of children, just completed her menstrual, um, menstrual cycle, not bleeding anymore, mikvah and everything else, cleansed herself, the clean clothes, clean bedding and all of this, brought two turtle doves, in her, uh, holding a moaner uh, close to her chest, to the temple priest to be offered in her thanksgiving ceremony, her Madim ceremony, thank you for pronouncing me kosher as being clean. I thought that was a good way to end this parsha. This is the end of this Parsha. But I want to talk to you about something um, very important here. Over a period of time, the Middle Ages, I would say uh, the first account of the story in the 1300, 1347 time frame, there were a lot of things going on uh, in Europe that, that you did not have empirical evidence, or empirical science, you didn't have microscopes, you didn't understand microbiology, virology, and all of this. You did not know why people were getting sick, why people were dying young, why children were dying young. Black plague was was from a parasite on a, on a, on a rat or mouse or something that spread a bacterial infection and killed a lot of people. And then you had so many people die so quickly, then you had problems with disposing of the bodies. Then the, then getting diseases from that too, and then contamination of water supply. In third world countries, this is a huge problem. We have a massive plague and epidemic, and then the groundwater is contaminated, and then everyone else gets sick, unfortunately. Not as bad as it was in Europe. The problem was the Jews were in the middle of this. So they were already labeled by Christians then as the Christ killers, so they automatically pointed to the Jews, you caused the Black Death. You cause, uh, you poison the local water supply. And in fact, in France, this happened. It's horrible. There was, there was an outbreak there, an epidemic, people, thousands of people dying. So they took out 2,000 Jews in a riot and burned them to the stake um, in uh, Strasbourg, Germany. Now, if that's not bad enough about the Black Plague, which is caused by a parasite on a rat, not a Jew, the spread of syphilis across Europe was frequently associated with the invasion of Naples by the French army. You know what army soldiers do. However, uh, since, since fewer popular theories have were developed at that time, what do you do in 1492? Palen Palenon de Ar Argon and Isabel of Castilla, does that sound familiar, Columbus? Yeah. Issued an edict of expulsion of the Jews, stating that all the individuals of the Hebrew origins refusing to convert to Catholicism were to be expulsed from Spain and the rest of the territories. On this occasion, approximately 200,000 Jews have left the country for Northern Africa and Southern Europe. These are my ancestors. This happened to my ancestors, that same story, okay? Um, they were not, um, and also on their way as part of the temporary, they settled along the gates of Rome, they were not allowed in Rome, and in the new diaspora, an outbreak occurred, killing 3,000, uh, actually, I'm sorry, 30,000 people died in Italy, okay? Who was to blame? Well, therefore, some of the chronicles of the time blamed the Jews for the spread of syphilis in Europe. According to them, the disease was already present on Italian territory before Naples' invasion by the French in 1495. It's just a coincidence, the Jews were exposed from Spain, then went to Italy, and then there was an active contagion that syphilis going on, 
it's a bacterial infection. They didn't have antibiotics and everything else. Um, and then a lot of people died. And again, because they were predominantly Roman Catholics, they blamed the, Chris, blamed the Jews for that. Okay, today, menstruation is defined as a cyclical discharge of blood, secretions, and these debris from the uterus, a non-pregnant uh, uh, breeding age, um, even, I'm sorry, monkeys too, primate female, approximately monthly intervals. Everything's tested in the lab. However, there is a lesser known understanding of the term which is used historically. Menstruation referred to bleeding in general. Yes, men can bleed from their bowels and things of this nature. Menstruation um, it means bleeding, uh, fluid issuing from the body. All of this was talked about in this Parsha. Now the Haftar, as in Kings 2, the second edition of Kings, Malachim, uh, chapter 7, verse 3 to 20. This is an interesting story. I had to read it a few times. I don't read it. I read it one, once a year. But essentially the way the story was, you have some lepers. Uh, it says right here, four men sitting at an entrance to a gate. Okay? Big city. And they said to each other, while we're just sitting here waiting to die, what are we going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? I just asked you what you're going to do. Anyway. In verse 6, now the Lord had called the Armenian camp to hear the sound of chariots and the sound of horses, the sound of a great army. God has done this several times to fool the enemy, the adversary. The king of Aram was an enemy, and he punished the Jews left and right in northern Israel. This is during that time of Elisha the prophet. So, and then they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired for us uh, the kings of the, Hitt of the Hittites. These are Canaanites. And they were actually had a business related partnership with the Hittite. Uh, and the kings of the Egyptians are coming to attack us. So they were very afraid. They dropped their swords, shields. Um, they even didn't make, make time to hoof their horses and saddle the horses and bridle the horses. They left. The gate was wide open and they left everything. They left the treasure and gold and everything else in food. Okay? So what do these four lepers do? So in verse 8, now these Mesarim, as it refers to them, came up to the edge of the camp, entered one tent, ate and drank, and they had probably had eaten and drunk and a good meal for a long time, and carried off from their silver and gold and clothing. It was abandoned, okay, it was abandoned. Finders, weepers, losers. And they, and they went and hid them and probably buried them someplace or hide them near the bush. And they returned and entered another tent and they hoarded these things and took them to the server, the private stash, okay? And they hid them. They did this several times. Now at the same time, the children of northern Israel plundered the Armenian capital of Damascus because they probably found out the gates of Damascus was open, that big city, and no sign of the king or his soldiers. So they came in and plundered, plundered it. It was so bad when actually the king and his men returned with no weapons or anything else, he assigned one of his generals to stand by the gate, trying to close the gate and get the people out from stealing everything. The gate, so it was a, such, you've heard a situation where at concerts and things like this, where people can just get run over. I mean, trampede of people. And this is what happened. Literally pushed the gate down over the general and the military officer and killed him. Actually, Elisha made this prophecy and it came true. The man of God, Elisha, prophesied that the king's appointed officer at the city gate would die, and he did. What's the purpose of this story? Okay, first of all, these four men, the Mazarim, whatever, does not say if they're Jew or Gentile. I presume they were um, our means and people of, in Syria, okay? And they were just in a very difficult circumstance. They were pretty much left out there to die by the king. Listen, God is, loves charity cases, and he was trying to make a point. God was watching over those four pitiful souls. He took care of them, their needs. It doesn't say they're ever healed, but it says that he gave uh, at least the king of northern Israel a temporary victory, victory on the leadership of the prophet Elisha. Okay? I hope you enjoyed this Parsha. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of Jewish history in the Middle Ages. Yeah, the Jews that were blamed for COVID, they were blamed for the Spanish flu, uh, they were blamed for everything, right? Because we're Christ killers.
Yes. That, that, that stigma still goes around and goes around and goes around, right? Listen, we're hated by the Muslim. You know, Roman Catholics pretty much treat us fairly decent these days. It's the evangelical Christians that can send missionaries to Israel and try to convert poor, innocent, nursing home elderly women and then literally translate the New Testament into Yiddish and try to falsify the Word of God. These kind of things are happening. Rabbi Tobias Singer is talking about all, all the nonsense. Well, listen, this is Rabbi Yara Benemet signing out before I go. Remember, let the love of God go with you everywhere. The truth of God. The wisdom of God go before you in your inner witness. If you have things going on in your heart and mind that shouldn't be there, at least put a smile on your face and let people know it's okay. Because you know there are people that are more miserable and hurting more than you could ever imagine out there. Be that light of hope for them. You know, remember Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 20, 21, 22, and 23. God has a redemption plan for the Gentile. He has a redemption plan for everyone. He doesn't expect gold and silver and um, hordes of money, a million shekels, to make re a retribution for your sins. Just fall on your face, say, I'm a sinner, please forgive me, my Lord, my God, and make retribution to those people that you've wronged and hurt. Okay? Don't fall upon the government to pay off your student loan. You know it's immoral and unethical. That's not what I'm talking about. God cares about who you are and what you are, whether you're a Jew or Gentile. Listen, we all came from the three sons of Noah, right? You all are special in God's eyes. Listen, the Jews didn't pass over. Understand we were all B'nai Noah in Goshen, Egypt, until we went to Mount Sinai, received the Torah, and then God chose us as his holy nation of Yehudim. Everyone have a wonderful Passover. I really mean that. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Um, I had I had a little visitor with me when I got into my SUV at the garage I park at work. I had my sunroof open because it was kind of warm today. A sparrow had come in there. I did not know until it was on the highway. And I saw something fluttering to my right. And I saw a little sparrow on the passenger front seat just sitting there. I'm not sure what that meant. But the bird uh, rode home with me. I turned off the news and music and all this, and I just sang the bird, try to calm it down, I'm sure it was more afraid than me. The little bird was there in the back on the floorboard, just waiting. So I brought him home with me and let the bird go, and it flew out. What does that mean? It was a blessing, and I thought about the turtle doves and the woman and redemption and everything else. There's so many Jewish lore about the sparrow, about a soul departing and things of this nature. Listen, God is always there, even in the sweetest and humblest of things like a little sparrow. Take care. Before you miss Reb Yar Ben Emmet, know that I'm working on another exciting video presentation for you because you deserve it. You deserve the work that I do and the research I do for you to get forth for you the Emmet truth whenever I can. Take care. Shalom. And I'll see you real soon.